uh, not because I'm the preacher, but because the Holy Spirit has a serious mission to accomplish. And you'll be participants in that. Uh, as you can see, we're recording this conference uh, for television. I'm going to talk about the church for many obvious reasons. I was in St. Louis a few weeks ago. When I landed at the airport, the pastor greeted me with some other people, and he told me they had a real disaster in progress in the Archdiocese of St. Louis. There was one going on in Boston, too, as you know. Several priests, pastors, had been removed from their parishes in the week immediately preceding my arrival for a mission. For 14 days, in all of the major newspapers in that area, the Afghanistan war was page two, and the scandals in the Catholic Church, page one. He asked if I would please address the issue, because a large number of people were confused, saddened, and angry. And so I addressed the issue all weekend. I did the best I could. Early Sunday morning, I went back to the airport. I was waiting for my flight. There was a little child playing on the floor. His mom was there. The child smiled at me. I smiled back at the child. The mother reacted so violently snatching the child up, giving me a look that could kill, and stormed off as if to say, you're one of those, and I don't want you anywhere near my child. And so this weekend, I'm going to talk about the Catholic Church, body and bride of Christ, or whore of Babylon. A lot of people are asking, which one is it? I'm going to give six talks. The first one this evening on the church as the body and bride of Christ. And then tomorrow I'll give one on the priesthood itself, the sacrifice, the service, the crucifixion of priesthood. I'll talk about the Eucharist as the source, center, and summit of the church's life. I'll talk about Mary, the mother of the church. And I'll talk about Peter, the Pope, the rock in Christ on which the church is built. And finally, I'll talk about scandals. It is necessary that scandals come, Jesus says, but woe to the man through whom they come. We are living in very difficult times, very strained times, very confusing times. Centuries and centuries ago, out in the Egyptian desert, there were men called hermits or anchorites, they went off to the desert to do penance, to become holy, to pray, to mortify themselves. And there was a novice. And this novice was having struggles with chastity. And he went to an old monk, an old hermit, who was reputedly the most holy man in the desert. And the young novice went to the old father and he said, Father, now, everybody knows that you're the holiest monk 
out here in the desert. I'm having temptations against chastity. And I want to ask you, Father, when do they go away? And the old monk looked at him at, in amazement and he said, well, my son, from what they tell me, two or three days after they put you in the ground, if that's any comfort to anyone. <laughs> and the young novice said to the old monk, but Father, in the ages to come, will people in the church be as strong as we are today? Will they, will they fight as valiantly? Will they be able to pray unceasingly? Will they fast, keep vigil, and do penance like we do? And the old monk, as though seeing into the future, said, Ah, my son, in the age to come, people will become so weak that they'll scarcely be able to fast even one day. And they won't stay up night after night keeping vigil in prayer like we do. They will be so weak, and yet they will be greater than we, for we fight Satan chained, and they will fight Satan unchained. And so here we are in the 21st century, fighting Satan apparently unchained, the church beautiful body and bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read to you from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. The body is one and has many members, but all the members, many though they are, are one body, and so it is with Christ. It was in one spirit that all of us, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, were baptized into one body. All of us have been given to drink of the one spirit. Now the body is not one member, it is many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, would it then no longer belong to the body? If the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, would it then no longer belong to the body? If the body were all eye, what would happen to our hearing? If it were all ear, what would happen to our smelling? As it is, God has set each member of the body in the place he wanted it to be. If all the members were alike, where would the body be? There are indeed many different members, but only one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, any more than the head can say to the feet, I do not need you. Even those members of the body which seem less important are in fact indispensable. You then are the body of Christ. Every one of you is a member of it. Furthermore, God has set up in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and miracle workers, healers, assistants, administrators, and those who speak in tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles or have the gift of healing? Do all speak in tongues, all have the gift of interpretation of tongues? Set your hearts on the higher gifts, the body of Christ, the church. You remember the first, the first reading this evening? Remember what it was? Let me refresh your memory. Saul 
was breathing murderous threats against the church. As he traveled along and was approaching Damascus, a light from the sky suddenly flashed around him. He fell to the ground and at the same time heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, sir, he asked. The voice answered, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now please note the reading. Who was Saul persecuting? The church. Saul was persecuting the church. What did Jesus say? You are persecuting me. You see, Jesus Christ and his church are one. That is the point of departure. Christ and his church are indissolubly one. Jesus the head, the church, his mystical body. The church is being persecuted from within and from without. And it is one of the most violent persecutions in history. And it has only begun. It is going to get a lot worse before it gets any better. The tip of the iceberg. Jesus once said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. St. Paul once said, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Do you know when you entered the church? They were baptized. I became a member of the church on June 1st, 1947. That's the day I was baptized. I was 10 days old. I became a member of the body of Christ, the church. That is a great, great day. That is a great, great dignity. Baptism is what brings you into the church. Valid baptism brings you into the church. If you are Catholic, if you are Baptist, if you are Presbyterian, if you are Pentecostal, valid baptism brings you into the church, and there's only one church. You mean to tell me that Presbyterian is a member of the church? Of course. How many churches are there? One. How many bodies do you think Christ has? He only has one. Valid baptism brings you into the church. We'll talk more about different aspects of it as we, as we go along. I'm trying to, at the outset, get you to understand that the church is sacred. How sacred do you think the mystical body of Christ is? Very sacred, right? The body of Christ. You remember what St. Paul said? Do you not know that you are temples of the Holy Spirit? Therefore, don't defile the temple. Do you know why the church is indefectibly holy? Do you know that the church is indefectibly holy? That's a fact. Uh, every once in a while, someone will jump on me for that. But it is an absolutely true statement. The Catholic Church is indefectibly holy. Now you may say, how can that be? Well, because the head of the church is Jesus Christ, and the soul of the church is the Holy Spirit. Is the church indefectibly holy because of me or you? Heck no. 
we're in big trouble. <laughs> if that's the case, point number one, the church is indefectibly holy because her head is Jesus Christ and her soul. Do you know, you know what the soul is? The soul is the form of the body, we say in, in uh, philosophy. The soul is what breathes life into the body, the animating force of the body. The Holy Spirit breathes life into the church. The Holy Spirit is the soul of the church. Do you know what the word Holy Spirit comes from? From Hebrew, Ruach HaKodesh, breath of God. Isn't that interesting that Holy Spirit, the third person of the Blessed Trinity, that comes from a Hebrew word which means breath, of God. No breath, no life. No oxygen. No life. The breath of God. That's the soul of the church. That's why the church is indefectibly holy. The head of the church, Jesus himself. Okay, so make sure you know that. Because Satan is really doing his best to destroy the church. Now, in case anybody has any doubts, the church will survive this or any other crisis in history. The church will still be standing when Jesus Christ comes again in glory. With no question, that's going to be the case. That is the case. The question is how much suffering we're going to have to go through between now and then. You remember in the course of our Lord's life, he was a priest, he was a prophet, he was a king, priest, prophet, and king. Jesus taught, didn't he? That's the prophetic dimension of Christ. He taught. Right? They called him rabbi. That means teacher. He was a ruler, though not of an earthly kingdom. He was a king, but not of an earthly kingdom. The authority is authority of service. Jesus said, I have come to serve, not to be served. And finally, he was a priest. And do you understand the essential element of the priesthood of Jesus Christ? All the priesthoods that went before the Levitical priesthood of the Old Testament, the pagan priesthoods, they had a common denominator. The priest offered sacrifice. He offered a sacrifice in expiation and atonement for the sins of the people, a vicarious sacrifice. He offered the sacrifice of a pigeon, a goat, a lamb, a bullock. But when Jesus, the high priest, entered time and space, he changed all that. For the priest offering was also the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So the priesthood has as its element to offer and to be offered. The consummation of priesthood crucifixion. Jesus said, the servant is no better than his master. Where I am, there my servant will be. And where is he but lifted up on the cross? Why? He said it himself, in order to draw all men to myself. Perhaps you have been wondering in recent days and months and years, what has happened to our church? How can it be if we have an indefectibly holy church that such horrible things can go on in the church. Well, it's because there are two elements, two dimensions in the church, divine and human. The divine part, that's the indefectively holy part. The human part, that's the sinful part. Many people have had their faith shaken tested. Do you know why God 
is allowing this evil. Now, of course, a lot of you know me, and a lot of you have been listening to me for years. And as one good lady said to me, a lady about 88, she said, Father, you know, I've been listening to you for 10 years, and you never say anything new. <laughs> and I said, my dear, you're an astute observer. <laughs> you're right. And the day I begin to say something new, run. Everything I have to say is about 2,000 years old. So I'm not going to come up with anything new. The church is the beautiful body and bride of Jesus Christ. Scripture uses that analogy, that language, the bride of Christ, too. I just showed you where we use the language body of Christ in St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. In the Old Testament and the, the New Testament, the imagery of the bridegroom and the bride is used. Jesus called himself the bridegroom. Remember when he referred to himself as the bridegroom, talked about wedding feasts and so forth? Uh, let me give you a story from my own life that rather uh, powerfully uh, illustrated it for me, for my own edification. I remember when I was, back when I was a novice, it was a Sunday, and I was the lector at Mass. And it was the main Mass at a, a place, a monastery where I was. And uh, I read the first reading. It was a crowded church, just like this. And the choir and the congregation, they were singing the response, responsorial psalm. Uh, and I was waiting to do the second reading. And wouldn't you know it, right in the first pew was a beautiful young lady. And she smiled at me. <laughs> well, it wasn't anything bad. But something passed between us. It was pure. Uh, it was a good thing, a beautiful thing. In an instant, in an instant, I was very sad because I knew that I would never marry. I knew my vocation. I knew what I was called to. I knew I would never have a wife. I knew I would never be able to share my life with someone share my heart, my mind, and I knew I would never have children. Great sadness overtook me. And almost simultaneously, though, a great joy flooded my soul. Ah, uh, you will have a bride. I shall give you my own beautiful, mystical bride church. And children, you'll have children beyond counting. And I knew beyond any shadow of a doubt that I would be ordained and that I would be betrothed, as it were, in a spiritual way, to the bride of Christ. You see, every priest is taken up in Christ the high priest, and Jesus' bride is the church. And so every one of us, in a sense, is espoused to the, the church. Every priest has that relationship with the church. Many of you are married. Probably most of you are married. Remember what it was like in the beginning? Great, huh? The honeymoon it was wonderful. You couldn't wait to be with each other. You couldn't wait to spend time together. It was great. I remember that's the way it was with me. My ordination day was like my wedding day. I had 10,000 people at my wedding. <laughs> I did. At St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City. And I remember I was so happy with my beautiful bride. I was so happy overjoyed, 
thrilled. I floated out of there. After the ordination, when we processed out, I floated out of there. And for many, 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 many nights, I'd wake up in the middle of the night just from my soul proclaiming, I'm a priest. I'm a priest. Thank God. I can't believe it. I'm a priest. Most of heaven couldn't believe it either. <laughs> but I was. And I was so happy about it. I, I was really thrilled to have the church as my beautiful bride in Christ. And then after some time went by, well, it's kind of like this, analogically speaking. You wake up one morning, you look over, and you say, ah, what have I done? You don't appreciate me. I work my fingers to the bone. And you don't appreciate me. Sound familiar? We're more alike than you think. the church, body and bride of Christ. The Catechism of the Catholic Church talks about it. Believers who respond to God's word and become members of Christ's body become intimately united with him. In that body, the life of Christ is communicated to those who believe and who through the sac sacraments are united in a hidden and real way to Christ in his passion and glorification. This is especially true of baptism, which unites us to Christ's death and resurrection, and the Eucharist, by which, really sharing in the body of the Lord, we are taken up into communion with him and with one another. It's a great mystery, the beautiful body of Christ. You are members of the body of Christ. The intimacy, the intimacy that we in fact have with Jesus is so great that we scarcely dare to even think about it. Have you ever considered it? Now, I know that you're all for the most part, very good Catholics. You know, you're the pillars of the church. You're the people who are interested and concerned about your faith. You're the ones who are here. Well, have you ever thought about that? That you're part of Jesus in such an intimate way? His very body, his mystical body. Now that is the church. What could be more beautiful more sacred, more holy than the very body of Christ. That being said, now consider for a moment the horror, the absolute horror, when members of the body of Christ commit such horrendous sin. And I am not saying that in a holier-than-thou kind of a way. Because believe you me, in one way or another, I've been there and I've done that. I can't look down on anybody. I once preached in a maximum security federal penitentiary and shared my personal testimony. Now, I was in there with murderers, the worst, rough guys. Very interesting experience to preach and see hundreds of the toughest, most hardened, brutal men crying. Very interesting experience. Afterwards, uh, the, the biggest, toughest guy in the bunch came right up the center aisle. He approached me. I wasn't sure if he was happy or not. <laughs> when he got up to me, he held out his hand, which was... I don't know, about this big. <laughs> and he broke out in a big smile and he said, Father, 
If God can forgive you, I know he can forgive me. I said, amen, brother. So I, 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 won't, I can't talk down to anybody. I have never met anybody worse than me in my confessional. I've often said that, and I mean it. I know me, you don't. I'm talking about, you know, years ago. I don't do the things I used to do, thank God. But I know what I have done, and I know how big God's mercy is, and I'm thankful for him. I was baptized when I was 10 days old. I was a member of the body of Christ. I defiled the very body of Christ. The great doctor and saint of the church, St. Peter Damien, used to say, wherever one member of the body of Christ is, there the entire body is made present through the inviolable mystery of unity. Wherever you are, wherever I am, Wherever any baptized person is, there the entire body of Christ, the church, is made present in a mystical, beautiful, frightening way. Whatever good I do, in a mysterious way, is radiated to the whole church. Recently, I woke up in the middle of the night. I was in a foreign country. And I woke up in the middle of the night with a, an image of a friend of mine from high school. She was a, a very lovely girl. Kind, beautiful soul. She had a rough life after we graduated. She committed suicide. I woke up seeing her, thinking about her. I prayed for her and have ever since, the last few days, offered mass for her this evening. Whatever good I do has an effect on other members of the body of Christ, raises it up. The church has an effect on the world. Jesus gave us the church to hold the world in being. As the church is faithful to her mission, what's the mission of the church? The same as the mission of the Redeemer. The mission of Jesus is salvation, redemption. What's the mission of the church? Same thing. As long as we're faithful to that mission, we hold up the world. When we are unfaithful to that mission, we become tired of goodness and holiness. Our arms, so to speak, begin to sag. The world begins to sink into hell under the weight of its own iniquity. Whatever good you and I do affects the whole church, and that affects the whole world. Whatever evil you and I do, it affects the whole church and the whole world. Someone once asked me, Father, why do you think the world's in such a mess. Why do you think our country is in such a mess? Now, I'm about to become a senior citizen <laughs> next month, more or less. Right? I already got my AARP card. <laughs> I'll be 55 next month. From when I was a boy, to now, you know, I can look back on 55 years. 
And in that period of time, when I consider what the country was like when I was a boy, right, and what it's like now, morally speaking. Now, there are many improvements, good things, technology, medical science, and so forth. A lot of good stuff. But when I look at it just from a moral perspective, we're losing it, right? I mean, from, from when you and I were young to now, if you're honest, you've got to say there's a radical difference. And, and so the person was asking me, why do you think that is, Father? How come? I said, it's our fault. See, I, I really can't point the finger at anybody else. I can only point the finger at me, my fault. Why is it my fault? Because I have failed to be as holy as I should be. That's why it's my fault. Why is the world in a mess? Because the church is in a mess. Why is the church in a mess? Because individual members of the church are in a mess. Years ago, the bishops told us 75% of Catholics in this country in general don't even go to Mass on Sunday. Only 25% of Catholics in general bother to go to Mass on Sunday. A majority, at one point anyway, were in favor of artificial contraception. A large number voted and elected, voted for and elected a president who had just refused to repeal an atrocity such as partial birth abortion. Catholics reelected him, in case you don't know that. Why is the world in a mess? Because the church is in a mess. And why is the church in a mess? Because individual members of the church are in a mess. And the buck has to stop with me. I can't make you do anything. I've got to fight the good fight myself. We win this war one person at a time. It's easy to moan and groan to complain. It's another thing to do something about it. One woman approached me and said, we don't have any priests. We have no vocations. I'm, I'm angry about it. Why haven't they been promoting vocations? And I quite simply asked her, my dear, in the last 25 years, how many hours of your time have you spent praying for vocations and for priests? Now, you might stop for a moment at this point and ask yourself the question. Think about it. In the last 25 years, five years, year, month, whatever, how many hours, minutes, have you spent praying for priestly vocations? Have you spent praying for your priests. As a comparison, you might do a little exercise and ask yourself, how many hours in the last 25 years have I spent watching television? And see how well you come out in the comparison. I've got to do that with myself. You know, a little reality check. We have a crisis. We can respond to it and overcome it and profit by it and transcend it and be purified by it and ultimately glorified by it. Or we can wimp out, shrivel up and die. And that's how serious it is. This is an in-your-face crisis, and it affects every last one of us. Since I have been a priest, I have been laughed at, scoffed at, 
spit at and shot at. I have never been more conscious of being loved and hated since I have been a priest. In recent months, in the shadow cast by these scandals, somebody asked me, could you recommend the priesthood to a young man? And my response is no. Not by any human standards, I cannot. But if he wants to be a saint, then yes, I can recommend it. There was a long time when being a priest carried a certain prestige and a certain respect in society. And a man could be comfortable in the priesthood. He could be well respected. He could have a pretty decent life. All the wrong reasons. Now, you better have only the right reasons or you won't make it. Why does God permit evil? In order to draw greater good out of it. Those of you who've been listening to me for the last 10 years have heard me say that a lot of times. Why did God allow September 11th, horrible evil, to draw greater good out of it? Why is God allowing the scandals in the church? That's an evil. Make no mistake about it. That's a horrible evil. Why does God permit it? To draw greater good out of it. Somebody might say, oh, God doesn't permit that. Oh, yes, he does. It happened, didn't it? God's all-powerful. He could have prevented it. Why does God allow any evil? To draw greater good out of it. You, could, you might say, prove it. I'll point to a crucifix. In itself, the greatest evil imaginable. God, tortured, murdered, deicide, greatest evil in itself, and yet the greatest good, the good of redemption. You see the paradox of the cross, the paradox of why God permits evil, to draw greater good out of it. What effect is this going to ultimately have on the church? To purify. You know how jewels, diamonds, rubies, emeralds, you know how they polish them? Put them in a tumbler with grit, abrasive material. Tumble them to shine them, take off the dullness. You know how they purify gold, silver, any precious metal? Put it in a crucible and turn up the heat, what happens? Burn off the impurities. How about steel? How do you temper steel? Takes heat, doesn't it? Where well, we are in the crucible, and the heat is being turned up, and it will result in a purification and a strengthening. And the church's latter glory will be greater than her former glory. And that is an absolute certainty. And don't doubt it even for a moment. For like my good mother often reminds me when I become discouraged, and I do, I admit it, she'll take the Bible and she said, all right, priest, son, theologian, smart guy. Mothers are still mothers, no matter how old you get. Mom is mom. We know the last chapter. We win. We win. (laughs) 
But this book is filled with an awful lot of pain and suffering. On my liturgical calendar, Good Friday always precedes Easter Sunday. No pain, no gain, no cross, no crown, no gall, no glory. It's written in every page of creation. It's written in the book of life. What Christ the head has gone through, his mystical body, the church, must go through. Jesus suffered. Humiliation. Think about it, the passion. We just went through Holy Week not that long ago. We're in Easter season now, but we went through Holy Week, the Paschal Mystery. The humiliation, the pain, crucifixion, death. Think about what Our Lady must have felt. St. John and the pious women at the foot of the cross. Jesus, who they loved so much, so humiliated, so disgraced, so tortured. Think what they must have felt like. And now you will perhaps begin to understand what many of you are feeling about the church now. In her humiliation, in her pain, in her agony, in her passion, climbing the Via Dolorosa, Mount Calvary, crucifixion, darkness, covered the whole earth. And the veil in the temple was ripped from the top to the bottom. A new order was about to begin. Something mysterious was happening, something above nature. And that's what's happening in the church. God is permitting it. Why? To bring a greater good out of that terrible evil. Now, don't think for a moment that I'm saying that the evil is okay. I'm not saying that at all. Now, tomorrow I'll talk more about the nature of these scandals. And I promise you, as always, I'll speak from the heart. And I'll say exactly what's on my mind. And I don't have the slightest doubt that I will make enemies to the left and to the right. But. Like one of my elderly lady friends said to me one day, Oh, Father, I know your greatest gift. And I said, You do? She says, Yes, most people think it's the gift of preaching, but I know better. I said, You do? She said, yes. Said, well, what is it then? She said, Well, your greatest gift is that you don't give a fat rat's you know what. <laughs> who likes it and who doesn't? Oh, those elderly ladies are my buddies. They're all praying the rosary for me, keeping me alive. We've got a crisis. We can run from the crisis, pretend the crisis doesn't exist, ignore the crisis, be indifferent to the crisis, cowardly in the face of the crisis, or we can stand up and face it, head on, and tell the truth. And where there is guilt, humbly take the blame. And where is it, there is a need for atonement, to offer atonement. And where we need to not badmouth someone who's fallen on their face, pray for them. I, I tell you, other than the victims of these scandals, you know, the abuse cases that are in all the headlines, other than the victims and their families, I'll be honest with you, nobody 
has a right to be more aggravated and angry than me. I gave up my life to come into this. I gave up a career. I could have been a lawyer. I could have been a lot of things. I could have made a lot of money. I could have done a lot of things. But now I've got to endure the stares and the scorn. I've got a right to be aggravated and angry. And I'll admit sometimes I am. But it doesn't do a bit of good. Rather, we have to take that offering to the Lord and do something about it. You've got a place on the battle line. And so do I. You've got to pray. You've got to offer reparation. We have a mission to accomplish, and I'm going to try to express it simply and clearly. We have to stop acting like a triumphant church. That's in heaven. The church triumphant is the church in heaven, not the church on earth. The church on earth is called to be a servant church, a humble church. You know what servants do? They do hard things and dirty things. They do things nobody else wants to do. Servants don't lord it over people. Servants serve people. Jesus said, I have come to serve, not to be served. And then he stretched out his arms and he died on a cross. The height of service is ultimately crucifixion. The church is being crucified. Some of it is our own doing. You got to call things by their proper name. Good and evil by their proper name. I don't want to get started too soon because tomorrow you come with your seatbelt. <laughs> because I'm bringing my cannon and the walls are going to shake. And I'm going to tell you what I think about it. But for now, I'll say this. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. My brothers and sisters, the Catholic Church, body and bride of Christ, or the whore of Babylon, you and I know the answer. The Church is indeed the beautiful mystical body and bride of Jesus Christ, indefectibly holy because Jesus is her head and the Holy Spirit is her very soul. Yes, we, the members of the body of Christ, we're human. We're frail, we're fragile, we're sinful. We walk along this painful journey called life. We struggle, we trip, we fall in the mud. We get up, we go on. Over the years, I've had a lot of people come and talk to me. In recent years, the older I get in the priesthood, I've had more and more priests even come to me. And please don't misunderstand me and hear me out all weekend. Don't just grab on a word or two that I say and misinterpret it. I am as upset about this as anybody. I am not quick to excuse anybody's sin, including my own. And I have plenty of sin. But by the same token, I tell our wounded brothers, you're in a war. And in a war, soldiers are wounded. It is not a disgrace to be wounded. It is a disgrace to desert under fire.
as it were, we are all wounded healers. And although I am not saying to ignore it, no way. I am not saying to let it go on, no way. But I am saying take appropriate action where criminal behavior is present. Treat it as we treat criminal behavior. Where psychotic behavior is involved, treat that as we treat psychotic behavior. But above all things, put on love, which is patient, which is kind, which is quick to forgive, which has the attitude, except for the grace of God, there go I. That has the attitude, I am not without sin. And therefore, I cannot be the one to cast the first stone. Rather, I will reach down and help my brother up. I'll pray for my brother. I'll do penance for my brother. Because my brother is a member of the beautiful mystical body and bride of Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters, when you go home this evening, remember that the church you belong to is the very body, the very bride of Jesus Christ. And don't let this business throw you. It has happened in one way or another throughout history. We're going to go on. We're going to survive. And in the end, when the dust settles and the smoke of battle is blown away and time gives way to eternity, we're going to stand before Jesus, a just yet merciful judge. And having run the race to the finish line, perhaps not perfectly, but all the way to the end, you'll hear these beautiful words. Well done, my faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you.